Welcome to Insight, today produced in partnership with KCOS 13, El Paso Public Television. Today we are chatting with Soshi Rodriguez, Executive Director and Co-Founder, and Randy McGuire, Director of Programming and a Fellow at the Caldo Collective. Soshi and Randy have generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So art, art, <laughs> art. Talk about art. Talk about the Caldo Collective. We started our Caldo journey about four years ago now. Um, it started around a table uh, with a few a few friends that uh, had recently sort of traveled and come back or who had stayed in El Paso um, and were feeling frustrated with um, a few things, right? The lack of opportunities for artists, um, more specifically, the lack of funding opportunities, but also opportunities to share work and uh, to create spaces where work could be made together with the community. Um, sort of to answer those those needs, we started uh, started thinking concretely about um, how to create an organization that could address address those needs. Um, another another big thing that we were looking at was the role of community in art. So we wanted to make sure that we we addressed what artists were were expressing they needed, but we also wanted to be sure that we looked at what the community could experience if we successfully um, created more opportunities for artists. So you have artists around a table. Mm -hmm. Artists are not known for uh, necessarily being financially prosperous, so money no. is always going to We're be an so issue. We're so broke. <laughs> yeah. And engaging community requires outreach, and, mm -hmm. and artists want to, to do their art. They don't yeah. want to put together the funding as much. They don't want to spend their time in promoting. How did this whole thing come together so that you created a hospitable environment for art to actually be take place, to, to be created, and then to be shared? Yeah, so I think it's still, <laughs> we're it's, still working. It's, it's still a work in progress. Um, but uh, we, we sort of went at it through two broader channels. Uh, the first one was uh, answering the question of, okay, there's no money, so how do we find that money? Um, and since we're dealing with art with a capital A, we didn't necessarily want to begin by, you know, applying for grants or seeking uh, funding from existing organizations, you know, that, that had the buku bucks. Instead, we wanted to try to tackle both sides of the equation by finding the money, but also creating a relationship with the community in doing that. So um, taking the lead actually from Project Incubate, who's um, out of Chicago, we started doing Sunday Soups only. We... Um, we had to and have to always put a spin on everything we do that makes sure it's relevant in our crazy, unique community. So Sunday Soups is what? Sunday Soups is um, a series of public feasts that uh, bring the community in, the public in, to listen to artists and their ideas. Um, they provide a donation at the door. They're fed a really good bowl of soup. And uh, at the end of the feast, all that money's put in a pot and the guests get to vote on their favorite idea. So there's... There's an earned income piece. Mm -hmm. There's a community building piece. Mm -hmm. There's a interactive, let's talk about mm -hmm. art Some dialogue. Piece. And of course, there's also, uh, you know, the important piece of ownership, um, which I think we have not really broached on quite a bit, but it is there and it, and it is a, a loud part of the, the puzzle. Um, the idea being that when a community invests in an artist and their work, they also take some ownership in that project and um, get to have their voice play out in the work. Um, that was a big, and we're still, that's a big part of what we're still working on, figuring out how to do most effectively. But So that, that how do you experience that as an artist? Because if you're participating in, a, in uh, one of these Sunday soups and all of a sudden people are critiquing your ideas, <laughs> They're not necessarily buying it. They don't necessarily get it. I, I know that you've never had this this type of an experience before. But actually, my uh, my initial experience with the Caldo Collective, I came in and I was a presenter at one of the feasts, um, and I I pitched my idea. And uh, it's funny that you should say that because you know, I mean, that is that is something you know. That's always kind of the challenge. I think at first, if you're trying to do things that are different it's not always very easy to explain or uh, kind of communicate the idea to other people. Um, and really, I think that actually my experience in presenting 
and, uh, and trying to think about how the public was going to react to that idea really helped me um, to kind of bring that particular project to, uh, to fruition. So who participates in the collective and how do you gain participation? So there's, there's a few ways. Uh, the feasts are administered through calls. So we put a call out and we also have a nomination process. So if an artist wants to um, participate in a feast and, and try to go after that funding, they can apply or they can, you know, connect themselves well and be nominated by one of the jurors. Um, the invitation process for those feasts, uh, I was mentioning that we, we shifted our approach to it a little bit. We actually have the feasts in people's backyards. Um, much like we all grew up doing, we just throw throw a party in a backyard. And uh, for my family, we always ate beans and rice. And that was like, we had a party with beans, rice, and horchata. Um, so that's why we're called the Caldo Collective. It's a bowl of caldo together that we share. Um, and in that way, we also really effectively have managed to reach beyond our network to, we now have had 11 feasts, something like that, um, 11 other people and their massive networks. And we have 100 people attend each feast. So if you do the math on that, that's an incredible number of people that we would never have engaged otherwise. Um, so we have, of course, the artists who access the process this way, and then um, our amazing community hosts access the process and give people access that way. So talk about the public art that, that has been created through this, this process. So sort of the, the main pillar that we, we've rested all this work on is uh, the idea of access. Um, access to participation in the arts, access to actually being able to view art, um, access to the spaces that, that create art for artists. So it, it's a two-way interaction that we're looking for. We want to give the public access to the artists, but in El Paso, we also want to make sure that the artists are able to access the public. So our very first inaugural public art project was um, in an alleyway in a neighborhood called Manhattan Heights. It's one of the historic neighborhoods in the city located sort of in central El Paso. And we took over the alley and created um, sort of three performance type stations. And this requires a, a considerable effort. You have to get city authority, you have to have neighborhood support. Yeah, that was you don't have neighborhood step. support, yeah. you can forget the whole thing. Yeah. Then you have to have- The permitting. The permitting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then once the permitting is done, you need site prep. Absolutely. And then you have the installation process mm -hmm. You have the security during the installation, mm -hmm. and then afterwards, if you have to remove, mm -hmm. then then that has to be done as well. Absolutely. So there's a considerable effort. There's a, there's a whole arc of activity that you're administering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's it's a lot a lot of coordination. Probably more coordination on that weekend than art making. It feels like. So the interesting thing about uh, about this this kind of event, particularly a first event, <laughs> is that if it doesn't work. You, it's okay. It, it, it's it's okay, but but it's tougher to do it a second time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the first time you had people experience it. Mm -hmm. How many people actually experienced it? What was what was that? The, the what were those days or that day uh, like for for the public? And how how many people uh, actually were able to experience the works? Oh, we probably Anybody? had more than a hundred people come through. It was two hours. Um, it was a little frantic, and we were worried because there was a storm coming. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, and we had a lot of technology, um, and all of our wiring came from homes. So like, right, right. You know, so you got electric. We had like electrical cords coming over walls. Um, so there was that element that was sort of really nerve wracking. A lot of people who we knew were coming were text messaging, like, "Oh my God, is it really going to happen? Are you still doing it?" Um, and we're crazy enough to just, you know, keep charging for it no matter what. Um, but I think the most, the most striking thing, Randy might be able to say more than I can because I was actually performing. Um, I was very tired and in it. Um, as a performer, I was, I was trying to ask people to enter the environment with me and to interact with the projections and to interact with the very simple installation to experience the sensors that were, um, that were changing the environment as I moved. And there were there was so much hesitation um, to make that happen. And I've performed in other places. Um, Kansas City probably is the main one where it, that interaction didn't feel so difficult to pull. 
um, or to inspire. Well, did you do it at the at the well, what is it the power the power plant? Uh, uh, I had a residency right? with the Charlotte Street Foundation, so okay. um, I did a few different projects. Well, the Charlotte Street Foundation also has a, a whole well, it has space. It also has a has a long history of, of mm -hmm. doing these kinds of things. Yeah. So people are more accustomed to it. Absolutely. But this was the first one that you had done here. No man's people, land. People were, were, they were a little bit uh, mm -hmm. hesitant? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. It was, uh, and that was uh, one of the things that we, that we definitely had at the, at the forefront of our minds when we went on to the next iteration of that project. How can we, how can we, <laughs> encourage the audience to to really interact with this and really engage with it in ways that uh, maybe they're not expecting. Um, you are actually providing an exhibition context. It's different than, yeah. a, than a building with walls in it, mm -hmm. but it is still an exhibition context and mm -hmm. it's also cross-disciplinary. Yeah. Talk about what you can do in contrast to a traditional uh, museum with that sort of building context. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind after this, the, the first year of that public art programming where we were sort of dealing with that poem, we, Randy and I had to have a hard talk about uh, the failures of that year, right? We had some great success, but um, we also, we could also see really clearly the ways in which we had failed. Um, and I think one of the, the biggest ways that we had failed for us was we had, we had work that engaged the public after it was made. We did not have work that engaged the public to be made. Um, so then we set out the following year uh, for a project called Root Work. And we took to the bus lines and we rode, we rode the El Paso Sun Metro for many, many hours over the course of many months from its point, point of origin on, directly on the border um, in downtown El Paso, uh, literally a block away from the port of entry there. Um, from there, we rode all the way to the end of I think five different lines repeatedly to reach um, people who who have to some degree been forgotten or go unnoticed on a daily basis. Did you talk with them? What Absolutely. Did you, what do you yeah. say? So you talk with them. What what were you talking to them? Were you soliciting their opinions, or were you talking about their experiences? Their experiences, their stories, um, where they were coming from, where they were going. Uh, and what what did you do with that with that information that you received? Randy talk about that because his yeah. Um, well, that was uh, you know it all culminated in uh, a final uh, exhibition also um, that was uh, a choreographed uh, you know piece uh, along with film uh, that we shot you know on the bus lines. Um, and uh, sound and uh, and music that was uh, you know in included material that we recorded while we were actually on those on those uh, trips. A lot of, of field material that we gathered, photos, video, yeah. Um, and I th and I think the main thing that we wanted, you know, as as kind of the months of of going through this process, um, we thought just the the best thing that we could do would be to just show that you know even in you know, every day, uh, in everyday experiences, you know, there is something beautiful and there's something important and valuable. Um, you know, even in those experiences that might seem, you know, mundane on the bus, you know, there's something still important happening, happening there. there. Sochi Rodriguez, yes. Brandy McGuire, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Caldo Collective with us and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.